Hello lovers, in this video Laura, who is an expert examiner, is going to take you through the whole of the AQA GCSE Biology Topic 1 Cell Biology. So she's going to explain everything to you in detail, point out to you any exam hints, any exam tips, what sort of things she will be looking for in an answer when she is marking the papers. You can use this to make notes as you're going along and then for every single section over on the website there is set free questions, flashcards to help you remember all the little bits that you need to. If you jump down to the description, you'll see there's links to our predictive papers, our walkthroughs to predictive papers, and the live sessions that we're doing to help you revise as well. We're here with you every single step of the way. Animal cell structure. So we need to be able to label a basic animal cell and to know what all the parts of the animal cell does as part of the function of the cell. So first up on the outer edge we have the cell membrane, then we have the cytoplasm. These little dots are representing ribosomes. You're very unlikely to need to be able to label ribosomes in a diagram in the exam. If they've got like lots of little dots all the way across the cytoplasm of the cell, that's just to kind of represent the cytoplasm. So it would be very specific and they look like special circles if they are talking about the ribosomes. Then we have the nucleus, which is the biggest circle shape structure inside the cell. And then we have the mitochondria. So these are normally little kind of oval shapes with wiggly lines inside. That's on a diagram how you would recognize that it's a mitochondria. So the cell membrane's function is to control the entry and exit of substances into the cell. The cytoplasm is where chemical reactions happen inside the cell. The ribosome's function is to do protein synthesis, which means to make proteins. The nucleus's function is to control the cell activities. And the mitochondria's function is it's where aerobic respiration happens and that provides energy for the cell. Now let's do the same with plant cells. So plant cells also have a nucleus. Plant cells also have ribosomes. They have a different oblong shaped structure to mitochondria, which are the chloroplasts. Again, these will look different to mitochondria. They'll be oblong shaped, but they often normally have little stacks of or disc shapes inside instead of wiggly lines. That's how you know it's a chloroplast. Then we have our mitochondria. There's normally a large space area, which is the vacuole or the permanent vacuole. Then the inner edge this time is the cell membrane and the outer edge is the cell wall. So I've filled in all of the functions of the parts that we've already looked at in the animal cell. For the new parts, the chloroplasts function is to absorb light energy for photosynthesis. This whole phrase is something you need to learn for the exam. The permanent vacuole contains cell sap, but it's function is to be able to support the cell structure. And the cell wall is strong because it is made of cellulose and that is also there to help the cell structure. If you're comparing animal and plant cells, there are only three differences, which we've already spoken about, so the three features that are found in plant cells that are not found in animal cells are the cell wall, the vacuole, and the chloroplasts. Otherwise, everything else is the same. Both animal and plant cells are classed as eukaryotic cells. The word eukaryotic is used to describe any cell that has a nucleus and that inside the nucleus is where the DNA is kept. So because both plant and animal cells have a nucleus, they are both eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells is a different type of cell. These cells do not have a nucleus. The name prokaryotic literally means before the nucleus. So they evolved before a nucleus became a structure in cells, so they are without a nucleus. An example of a prokaryotic cell is a bacterial cell, and their DNA is just found in the cytoplasm floating around, not inside a nucleus. 
we need to be able to label structures in bacterial cells as an example of prokaryotic cells. So they also have a cell membrane, their inner layer around the edge. They also have cytoplasm. They have sometimes a different structure called a flagellum, but not all bacterial cells have this. They have little loops called plasmids. They have ribosomes. Their DNA or their chromosome is just floating in the middle in the nucleus, as we said. And they have a cell wall, but it's a bacterial cell wall that is not made of cellulose. So again, I've put on the functions for the parts that we're familiar with. For the flagellum, again, remember only some bacteria have this, not all, but it's used for moving around or swimming. So the plasmids are small extra loops of DNA that often contain useful genes, like antibiotic resistance. The bacterial cell wall is for structure, but also for protection. We have to be able to compare prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. The main two differences are that there are no mitochondria or chloroplasts in prokaryotic cells and there is no nucleus. One similarity with plant cells is that there is a cell wall in prokaryotic cells. However, the cell wall in prokaryotic cells is not made of cellulose, so there is still a difference there. These diagrams we've looked at are very basic cell diagrams, but most cells don't look like this. Cells change their size, shape, and internal or subcellular structures to carry out specific functions in organisms. These are known as specialised cells. There are some specific examples of plant and animal specialised cells that we need to know. Root hair cells are one example of plant specialised cells. You can see here I've labelled all the structures we were labelling on our basic plant cell, but there's some things that are different. No chloroplasts this elongated shape, for example. All of this is to help the root hair cell carry out its function, which is to absorb water and mineral ions from the soil. Xylem and phloem are two other types of specialised cell and plants that we need to know. They're highly specialised because they're very different from normal basic cells, and they transport substances around the plant, that's their function. Phloem transports sugars and amino acids, and the xylem transports water. Some animal examples we need to know. So a sperm cell, again, I've labelled all the structures that we're familiar with from the basic cell, but you've also got the flagellum, which is allowing it to help it swim to the egg, which is one of its main functions. A nerve cell, again, very similar. We can label all of those similar structures from the basic cell that we can see, but the difference in the shape here, the really long axon, is to help transmit electrical impulses across long distances. And finally, muscle cells. These cells have lots of mitochondria. So although they look pretty basic, actually they contain a lot more of mitochondria than a normal basic cell because they need that to provide the energy to contract, which is their function. You should be able to recognise these specialised cells, but also be able to label all of the structures that we normally label in a basic cell on these cells that look slightly different. Cell differentiation. Cells become specialised through the process of differentiation. This is where different genes are turned on or off in each cell to change their shape or the number of subcellular structures that they have. And this is what allows them to become adapted to carry out a particular function. Undifferentiated cells, so cells that have not yet differentiated to become specialised, are known as stem cells. So you can see here I have a stem cell and then that stem cell can go through the process of differentiation to produce red blood cells or a neuron or epithelial cells or white blood cells or muscle cells or bone cells. It depends on what that process of differentiation looks like in the cell determines what cell it's going to look like at the end. Differentiation is different between plant and animal cells. Plant cells mostly have the ability to differentiate throughout their whole life, which is what makes cloning plants possible because you can cut off a piece of leaf or stem tissue, 
and those cells can differentiate into root cells and you can create a new plant that way. Animal cells are not like that and they do not have this ability. Most animal cells differentiate in an early stage and once they're specialised, very few of them can change or become stem cells again. They just divide by mitosis to replace themselves. So an example here is why differentiation of mitosis is important in animals is because we start off as a fertilised embryo and then that goes through mitosis to develop a ball of cells. But all of these cells at this point are stem cells. As the embryo starts to develop and grow into a fetus, cells go through differentiation to produce all the different cells and tissues that the body needs. Eyes, ears, brain cells, heart cells, muscle cells, bone cells, all of those will be produced through differentiation. And then once that's happened and you have all of the cells and tissues in the body that you need to have a full organism, then we just go through the process of mitosis in order to grow and get bigger. So to grow from a small fetus into the full sized baby, and then from a baby into an adult. Microscopes. This is an optical or light microscope, which you may have used in school. Initially, they had mirrors, which would reflect sunlight or lamplight, but now we have electric bulbs in the bottom, and the light travels up through a glass slide, through objective magnifying lenses, and into the eye of the person looking down the microscope. The reason that we have microscopes is because they magnify images. So what we're able to do is make a structure on a living material, such as cells, bigger and appear bigger than they actually are so that our eyes are able to see them. We can calculate the magnification of a microscope by doing the image size, so the image that we see from the microscope, what we can measure in that, divided by the actual size of the object we're looking at in real life. So this is basically telling you how many times we have multiplied the size of the real object in order to be able to see it in the image. Optical or light microscopes are great and they've been able to show us many things, but we're only able to see like the nucleus inside a cell and just about mitochondria at about 1,500 times. But really that's the level of detail we can go to. Anything smaller than mitochondria like ribosomes, we're just not able to see using a light microscope. Electron microscopes are one of the newer technology microscopes we have. They have much higher magnification and resolution ability than a light microscope. This means we can see more structures that are smaller than with a light microscope. And the reason is because the microscope has the ability to see separate objects clearly at high magnification, which is what is meant by resolution. They're really important in terms of our discoveries because we've been allowed therefore to see inside cells in way more detail and even inside subcellular structures like mitochondria and chloroplasts. And even in the smallest of organisms like bacteria, we've been able to see detail inside. It's been an important development in understanding life on Earth. You need to be able to explain and describe how to carry out a microscope practical where you can view structures on a microscope slide. First of all, we need to prepare the slide. This example is going to be with onion cells. So you would add a drop of water to a microscope slide. You would take a very thin piece of tissue, in this case, onion skin. It would need to be thin so the light can pass through it. We then need to stain it, in this case with iodine, so that we can actually see the structures inside the cells, like the nucleus and the cell wall. Then you would need to lower gently a cover slip on the top of your stained tissue to cover it before you put it on the microscope. So when you go to put it on the microscope, you would put it onto the stage. So your microscope slide goes onto the stage of the microscope and it's held in place by stage clips. Then you would need to rotate the objective lenses to the lowest power first. This is normally about four times. Once you've focused, you can come back to the objective lenses to increase the power to magnify the image more. At low powers, you use the coarse focus wheel to focus the image so that it is no longer blurry. 
At this point, then you can go back to the objective lenses and rotate them in order to increase the magnifying power. And then at high magnifications, you're going to use the fine focus wheel to make your image focused at a higher magnification. Culturing microorganisms. Bacteria divide really rapidly by a process called binary fission. They can split into two as fast as every 20 minutes. You can calculate this by using the following formula. You take the number of bacteria that you start with and then you multiply by two to the power of the number of divisions that have occurred. Bacteria can be grown in a liquid broth culture or on nutrient agar, which is like a gel plates. In order for them to grow successfully, they must have enough nutrients and oxygen and also be warm, so be at the right temperature, and there should be no contaminants. So there should be nothing else, no other microorganisms that can grow there that could contaminate the sample. So in order to prevent that, the first thing we should do before using these is to sterilise the broth, so the liquid medium or the agar plate, before you put any bacteria on it. So to produce our uncontaminated plates, we need to use the aseptic technique that you've seen in the video, where you flame all your instruments that are metal or glass, flame the neck of any open bottles, don't place anything down onto the bench, you should be holding it at all times. Once you need to put it down or you're finished, you can put it into disinfectant. You should disinfect surfaces and your hands before and after you carry out the practical, and you should always work near an open flame, which produces a hot airflow and carries any contaminants away from the, where you're working on the surface. After you've made your plates, for example, if we're going to look at antibiotic resistance and have put some discs on top of some bacteria on a plate, you need to incubate them at 25 degrees so that we don't get any pathogenic bacteria growing. We need to loosely tape the lids shut to have a lid sealed on top, but not completely sealed so the bacteria can still have oxygen in order to be able to grow. The plate should also be placed upside down so that no condensation can fall on the bacteria. Once we've left our plates to grow for a few days, we should observe the colony growth and look for any clear zones around our antibiotic discs. You can then measure the diameter in two places, normally at right angles to each other, and then use a mean of these two values and pi r squared formula to calculate the area of the clear zone around the disc. Larger clear zones around the disc will mean that more bacteria have been killed and so the antibiotic is better or stronger. Chromosomes. DNA is a long molecule that forms a twisted double helix. Sections of DNA are called genes. DNA is a really long molecule, so it has to coil up and coil up and coil up to form solid structures called chromosomes to fit inside the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, chromosomes are normally arranged in pairs. You can see them here in humans. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes in the nucleus of every cell in the body. Mitosis and the cell cycle. The cell cycle is the process that all cells go through to prepare for cell division and then to divide. And then it starts again as soon as they've divided. The majority of the cell cycle is spent in interphase, which is where the cell is preparing for division. So it replicates its DNA, so it doubles it. It grows in size, you can say the cell elongates, and it increases the number of subcellular structures. So as well as doubling the DNA, the numbers of things like ribosomes and mitochondria will also increase. After interphase, the cell is ready to divide, and that process is known as mitosis, which is where actual one cell divides into two identical daughter cells. Firstly, the chromosomes are pulled apart to opposite poles or ends of the cell. The cell membrane and cytoplasm then divides. This forms two genetically identical daughter cells that have the same chromosome number. This process of cell division allows organisms to grow, so from small organisms to large organisms as they grow older, 
and also to replace cells in damaged tissues or organs. Stem cells. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells which can produce different cell types through the process of differentiation. We've looked at these already before. There are three different types of stem cells or sources of stem cells that we have to know. The first is embryonic stem cells. These can differentiate into nearly any type of animal cell. Adult stem cells, which can be found in bone marrow, can differentiate into some type of animal cells, for example, blood cells, but not all types of animal cells. Plant stem cells are found in the tips of roots and shoots. These are known as meristems. They can differentiate into any type of plant cell. We mentioned before that plant stem cells can have this ability to differentiate throughout the whole of their life. And this is how we can use it to clone plants. This means we can make lots of plants really quickly. And that's useful in some cases because we can save rare species from extinction. Therapeutic cloning can be used to produce embryonic stem cells that are genetically identical to the patient. These stem cells can now be used to grow new cells that can replace the damaged ones that the patient needs. For example, blood cells after maybe a cancer treatment. To treat paralysis, we can grow nerve cells or nerve tissue when that's been damaged in the spine, for example, or pancreatic cells to treat type 1 diabetes. There are some ethical issues around using embryonic stem cells. There is an objection to the fact that the embryo cannot consent to be used, unlike if adult stem cells are taken from a patient that is able to consent. And the concept of an embryo being a potential life means that unused embryos being destroyed is not accepted by some people. There is also a risk of viral infection transfer, especially if the stem cells are coming from another person or potentially a cancer because stem cells can divide rapidly. So inputting dividing cells into the body could lead to a tumour. Diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So net just means overall. So the particles will move randomly in random directions, but overall, over time, more particles will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This is a passive process because it does not require energy. In terms of what's diffusing into and out of cells, mostly oxygen and glucose will be diffusing into cells as these are needed for respiration so they get used up and will be in low concentration inside cells. Carbon dioxide and urea diffuse out of cells. These are waste products for metabolic processes so they will build up inside cells and be in higher concentration so they will diffuse out. There are four factors that affect the rate of diffusion. One is the concentration gradient. If you increase the concentration gradient or difference in concentration then you increase the speed of diffusion. If you reduce the distance that particles have to travel, that increases the speed of diffusion. Mostly this is done by reducing the membranes needed to cross or pass through in order to be able to get from one place to another at the diffusion. Increasing the temperature increases the rate of the movement of particles, so that increases the speed of diffusion. And increasing the surface area of the membrane that particles have to cross also increases the speed of diffusion. There's more space for them to get across the membrane. All exchange surfaces will have adaptations to maximise the rate of diffusion. So exchange surfaces are places in organisms where majority of diffusion happens and these are why they have this adaptation. They will all have thin walls, a large surface area and good blood or air supply. Thin walls, such as having one cell thick walls in the small intestine in the villi, helps to reduce the diffusion distance and therefore speed up diffusion. 
a large surface area, obviously we know increasing the surface area increases the rate of diffusion. And a good blood or air supply is ordered to maintain a steep concentration gradient. So constantly substances that are diffusing through are being moved along to create low concentration gradient behind them. That means that diffusion keeps occurring in the right direction that we want it to happen. There are three specific exchange surface examples that we need to be able to explain and describe how they have these adaptations and how it makes them good at doing exchange. So for example, the alveoli in the lungs in humans, this is where gases diffuse between the lungs and the blood capillaries. The villi in the small intestine, this is where small molecules, so amino acids, glucose, fatty acids and glycerol, which are the products of digestion, diffuse from the small intestine into the blood and capillaries. And finally, leaves in plants. This is where gases will be diffusing in and out of stomata and into the spongy mesophyll tissue layers, where they will be exchanged with cells that are carrying out respiration and photosynthesis. This is all linked to this idea of surface area to volume ratio, which we need to be able to not only calculate, but explain. So surface area to volume ratio is where we divide the surface area of an organism by its volume. And we've gone with cubes here to give you an example, but the idea is that the larger the organism becomes, the smaller their surface area to volume ratio becomes. If you look at my cubes and if we think about diffusion, the distance between the centre of each cube and then to the outside or to the external environment is much greater in the larger organism with the larger length of size of the cube. So compared to its volume, the distance between its volume and all of its outer edges is longer. This means diffusion from the very inside of that organism to the very outside of that organism would be very slow because the distance is very long. So we can't just rely on substances diffusing from the outside into all of the cells in the body if we are a larger organism. Single-celled organism, like this example I've got here, do not need an exchange surface like the ones we've just looked at because they have a very large surface area to volume ratio because it's a short distance between all of their internal sections to their external surface membrane. So it's really quick for substances to diffuse from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell and therefore they don't need to have any adaptations to speed up that rate of diffusion. However, the larger an organism gets, the smaller its surface area to volume ratio becomes. So it needs these specially adapted exchange surfaces like alveoli, like villi, and then a transport system like our circulatory system in order to increase the rate of diffusion of substances into and out of every cell in the body so that it can happen fast enough for processes like respiration and photosynthesis to occur. Osmosis is the net movement of water molecules from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution through a semi-permeable membrane. It's really important when you're writing this definition in the exam that you say water molecules because it's the only water that moves by osmosis and you get the dilute and concentrated the right way around and you don't forget to add the part about a semi-permeable membrane. This could be a three mark definition so it's important to have all of that learned as part of your definition for osmosis. When we say a semi-permeable membrane what we mean is a membrane that lets small molecules through but not large ones, for example a cell membrane. You can get artificial permeable, semi-permeable membranes as well, and they can use those as an example in the exam. So it's not always something that happens just through cells. Just like diffusion, it's a passive process because it does not require energy. Water will move into or out of cells by osmosis depending on the difference in concentration of the cytoplasm of the cell, so inside the cell, compared to any solutions outside of the cell. Just like diffusion, it's affected by the same factors, temperature, surface area, and concentration gradient. If you increase the temperature, or if you increase the surface area, or you increase the concentration gradient or difference, 
then faster osmosis will occur. There are three conditions and we have to know what would happen to animal and plant cells in each of these conditions. Cells that are in a dilute solution, such as pure water, water will move into cells by osmosis because there is more water outside of the cells than in the cytoplasm of the cells. Animal cells can swell and they can burst. Plant cells will swell up, but they don't burst due to their cell wall stopping that from happening. When cells are in a solution that has the same concentration as their cytoplasm, there'll be no net movement of water into or out of cells. This means that no osmosis will occur. Cells remain in the same state in terms of how much water is inside their cells. This is why it's important for things like blood plasma, which is the solution surrounding red blood cells, to have the same concentration as red blood cell cytoplasm. When cells are placed in a more concentrated solution, such as salt or sugar solution, water will move out of the cells by osmosis. Animal cells can shrink and shrivel up. In plant cells, they don't shrink and shrivel up as much because their cell wall is very strong and stays pretty much in its shape. But the vacuole will shrink and the cytoplasm can pull away from the cell wall in extreme circumstances. Now you'll notice in each of these, I've used the same phrase about where water is moving to and from, and I've used the phrase by osmosis. That is really important. If you are answering an osmosis question in the exam, you have to use the word osmosis when you're describing not only where the water moves from and to, but how it moves, as in by osmosis. We need to be able to explain how we can do practical methods in order to observe osmosis happening. So this is an example, and most of the examples you'll see are where we use different concentrations in either salt or sugar solution, and we put a piece of plant tissue into that solution. This can be any plant tissue, aubergine, potato, red pepper, carrot. It doesn't matter what the tissue is, as long as it's got plant cells, because these cells will not shrivel or burst. We want them to just change in terms of their mass. And then we have to make sure that we keep all of our control variables correct to make sure that we're just observing what's happening to those cells as a result of being in the different concentrations of the solution. So in nearly every example of this practical, your independent variable is the concentration of solution because that is what is being changed. Your dependent variable is the mass of tissue or the change in mass of tissue from before and after the experiment. This makes sense because if cells gain water by osmosis, they'll increase in mass. And if they lose water by osmosis, they will decrease in mass. There are many control variables in this experiment. For example, the volume of solution, the time that the plant tissue spends in the solution should be the same for all the different concentrations, the length and volume of the tissue pieces, so how you cut them, they should all be the same size, but rather than saying size, use the words length and volume, because we're trying to make sure that they have the same surface area to volume ratio, because that can affect the rate of osmosis. The same type of tissue should be used, so from the same potato or from the same type of potato, for an example, so that there isn't differences between the cytoplasm of the cells. There should be no skin on any pieces of tissue because skin is made up of a different type of cells and this can be waterproof, so this can affect osmosis. The temperature of the solution should also be the same. You can either do this experiment in a water bath to keep it the same temperature or at room temperature is fine. Remember, control variables should be anything that could affect the results of the experiment, and in this case, it's anything that could affect the rate of osmosis in each of these different solutions. The other key thing to remember is that when we are weighing and measuring the mass of the tissue, after it has been in the solution, we need to blot our pieces of tissues dry to remove any solution so that doesn't affect the mass. I've got an example of a graph produced from data from this experiment and always need to remember that when we are looking at graphs like this, often they will ask you to show the concentration of the tissue. How could you use this graph to work out what the concentration of the cytoplasm of the cells in these pieces of plant tissues is? 
So if you plot percentage change in mass against the concentration gradient, and then you look for where the line of best fit crosses the x-axis, which will be zero. So at that point, there is zero change in mass. So we know that there's no water moving into or out of the cells. Therefore, in this case, the concentration that is closely closest to the cytoplasm of the cells in this example is 0.6 mole. So this is how you would use these graphs. It's always looking for where the line of best fit crosses the x-axis at zero, where that means there is no change in mass. Because that must mean that the concentration of the solution and the concentration of the cytoplasm of the cells is the same. So there is no osmosis. Active transport is the movement of particles from low to high concentration against their concentration gradient using energy. This is not a passive process, unlike osmosis and diffusion, because it requires energy from respiration. Unlike osmosis and diffusion, the rate of active transport is not going to be affected by the same factors. It's mostly affected by the rate of respiration. As the rate of respiration increases, the rate of active transport increases. This means that it can be affected by the number of mitochondria in a cell, or the availability of oxygen. If this isn't there or present, then less active transport is going to be able to take place because there'll be less respiration happening. It can also be affected by the number of carrier proteins. So the reason active transport requires energy is because we're using proteins in the cell membranes to actively change shape and move molecules from one side of the membrane to the other. We need to know two examples of where active transport occurs in cells. Plants, it's the root hair cells. These transport mineral ions against their concentration gradient from the soil into the root hair cell. The animal example can be found in the cells that are around the villi, which line the small intestine. These transport glucose molecules against their concentration gradient from the small intestine into the blood after equilibrium is reached. Both of these cells also carry out diffusion, but having this ability to do active transport maximises the absorption of these essential nutrients. So plants cannot survive without mineral ions, and in animals we need all the glucose we can get from our food in order to carry out respiration. So once diffusion has happened and these molecules have tried to move into cells down their concentration gradient, if there is still glucose left in the small intestine, and if there's still mineral ions in the soil, but there's a high concentration already inside the blood or inside these cells, they will use active transport to make sure they get every single last mineral ion or molecule of glucose to make sure that we absorb the maximum that we can. The adaptation of these cells is that they will have lots of mitochondria to help provide the energy needed for lots of active transport. Any cell that you get told or is given as an example of a cell that carries out a lot of active transport will require a lot of mitochondria to provide enough energy through respiration to do that process. Ouch! This is why in some videos I, I explain scratches.